أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون والذين هم عن اللغو معرضون والذين هم للزكاة فاعلون والذين هم لفروجهم حافظون إلا على أزواجهم أو ما ملكت أيمانهم فإنهم غير ملومين فمن ابتغى وراء ذلك فأولئك هم العادون والذين هم لأماناتهم وعهدهم راعون والذين هم على صلاتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون Because not all the verses were actually revealed in Mecca and Medina. So to strictly call it yeah, that in Mecca you have all these verses, they're called Mecca, and to strictly call it in Medina because they're revealed in Medina, it's not actually the truth definition. So, sir? 
Yeah, there were, there were, there were, there were verses that were revealed in Mecca when he did uh, conquer and everything. But the point is that after Hijrah, yeah, yeah, the point is that it's, it's, it, they put it after the Hijrah, and hence whatever is after the Hijrah is called Madani, even if it's revealed in Mecca. In Mecca. Does that make sense? So there, there is just a laugh amongst the scholars about this, but that's the strongest opinion amongst the scholars. And Allah knows best, inshallah. So to start off with, inshallah, the very first 10 verses, the very first 10 ayat of the Quran. Sorry? So the, the, the very first 10 ayat of the Quran, they actually have a lot of virtue. Um, and there are a couple of narrations that actually talk about their, um, their amazing lessons. So one of them is that the Prophet uh, he was actually making dua to Allah. And, and after the dua, he actually got revelation. And then he said, just now, 10 verses have been revealed to me, and anyone who follows them in letter and spirit will go to heaven. So inshallah, this is a very, a very important section of the Quran, because the first 10 verses, they actually highlight what are the key characteristics of the believer, right? And specifically the movement. I will describe what is the difference between the movement and al ladina amanu when we come to the first verse, inshallah. The second uh, narration that I want to also narrate was that uh, somebody questioned uh, Aisha the who was the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and asked her about the habits and the actions of our beloved Prophet. And she said that everything that he did was according to the Quran, according to the Quran. And then she recited these ten verses in the Quran and said, these are the ten verses that describe his behavior. So it's another very key important point that whoever practices this, whoever uses this outline inshallah for their daily life, it is as if you're trying to resemble the Prophet as quick as possible in a most summarized format. Alright? So inshallah to start off with. Now, what is the first verse of Allah? Ayah. It's up, in case you haven't heard. That's the, that's the surah upstairs, right? Qad aflaha al-mu'minun, right? A very, just a literal translation is basically successful indeed are the believers, okay? Now, when the Prophet sallallahu when he first got revelation, right? Who was rich and who was poor? Were the Muslims rich or were the Muslims poor? Were the Muslims rich or poor? In the Meccan things. Who they poor? Who put their hands up? Nobody put their hands up until I get All right? <laughs> put your hands up inshallah. So generally, the Muslims were poor at that time. All right? Now, the people who were rich were the Quraysh people. All right? And they were the non-Muslims. Most of them were non-Muslims. And they used to mock most of the companions through many different forms, but also through their wealth. And some of the traditions say that in order to make the Muslims feel so bad, they used to dress, you know, these long dresses. You see these Arab people, you know, like the whole dish dash and everything? They used to have longer versions of those. And you know those English weddings that you see, where the, 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 the gown just trails on the floor? They had something like that back in those days. And that was a means of arrogance. I have power. I am better than you. I'm stronger than you, right? So that was a means to mock the Muslims. And so, in order to try and you know, keep the Muslims at comfort, the Prophet ﷺ told them about these verses, right? And this is inshallah what our key focus is today. So to start off with the, the very first ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qad aftah al Now as you know, the literal translation is, indeed successful are the believers. Now the first thing which we need to actually make mention of is the word mu'min. There is a key significant difference between the word mu'min and alladina amanu, right? There's a key difference between the two. The word alladina amanu, right? If you read English translations for any form, they're translated as those who have faith or those who believe, right? Now, without getting too technical, alladina amanu is actually a verbal form, okay? Now, as you all know, verbs have three different tenses. You've got the past tense, right? You've got the present tense, right? And you've got the future tense, correct? Right? Simple and straightforward, right? So if I looked at my brother, beautiful brother Shiroz here, okay? And I, if I describe Shiroz, Shiroz was nice to me. This is in the past tense, correct? It's in the past tense. If I said, Shiroz is being nice to me, he's being nice to me in the present tense, right? And if I said, Shiroz will be nice to me, this is in the future tense, right? But if I just, if I said, Shiroz is just nice, yeah, he's just nice, right? It means it's a very permanent and inherent quality in him, right? It's very permanent. It doesn't have a time significance at all. He's just in him all the time. That is the difference between al-ladina amanu 
and mu'min. A mu'min is the highest level of iman. It's something that sticks with him all the time. He doesn't budge. He doesn't budge from it. Does that distinction make sense? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So the mu'min is the one who has firm iman. Very firm iman, right? Now, the second point which we want to mention in the first verse, aflaha, right? What does aflaha mean? Just someone read the translation for a candy. Who can read? Yes, chef. Huh? Succeeded. Succeeded. Who says? Catch, you can catch. Bismillah. Are you what? Who says? You should play cricket, chef. Hold on. Right. <laughs> so, it means success, right? But in order to truly appreciate that word, Aflaha, right? You, to truly appreciate it, you need to look at the roots where these things come from. And as you all know, Arabic has a very deep and vast uh, you know, background to it. Now the word Aflaha actually comes from the word Falah. Does anybody know what Falah means? Falah. Huh? Successor. Huh? Successor. Successor, sort of. But I'm talking about according to the Quraysh, the Quraysh, the older time Arabic. Yes? It's in the farm. Well done, Shaykh. Mabruk. Mabruk. Right, okay. So falah was referred to a farmer, right? And if the other connotation attached to it is something that is split. Something that is split. Now, a farmer, he splits the ground, only he splits the soil, only for two reasons. Why does he split the soil? For two reasons only. Can anybody guess? Huh? A farmer, yes? To grow seeds. To grow, to put in the seeds. Mumtaz, very good. You got another candy. Mashallah, brothers on fire. Right, so to put in the seed, that's the first reason. The second reason why you would open up the ground is to harvest the crops. To harvest the crops. This word, aflahab, refers to when the farmer used to take out the soil and to take out the crops, harvest the crops. And it sort of gives the implication that when farmers, right, it wasn't just a quick, easy job. You know, once they put in the seed, they had to water the, you know, the soil, they had to look after, make sure there were no infestations, they had to make sure that there were no ants, right? They had to make sure that it all was regulated, and so on and so forth. Many different things came across, right? Many different things came across. And after a year, if, if he was lucky enough, if he was lucky enough, only then would he get the harvest of the cross. Only then. So it's implying that the moment, right, he is always, always in a constant state of struggle. That's the quality of a movement. Yani, Jannah is not cheap. Jannah is not cheap, right? You all know the hadith that Jahannam is, you know, is surrounded by temptations and desires. You all know that. And how many of us here have said we have never fallen to temptation? Even if it's one look, or one thing we've said, or one thing we've heard, can anyone say that we were safe from that? No, none of us can say that, right? And we all know that Jannah has a lot of different trials in it. Very difficult to get to Jannah, so it's not cheap. So you've got to always make sure that you're constantly struggling. If you're not struggling, then you need to make sure you are inshallah. Maybe Allah has given you some barakah, you need to always prepare for the works. Always prepare. And keep, you know, keep straight forward on it, inshallah. Right? So that's where Qad Afnah al -Muhammad. And that's why the word Qad is used, by the way. Qad means for certainty. For certainty, Allah will make you you know, he will give you success. He will give the moment success. That's what the word Qad means. Qad means with certainty. Or when something is just about to happen, we use the word Qad. You know, in the Iqama, what do you say? Qad Qamat al Salah. Now, if, if it means that for surely Salah is about to happen. Surely your Salah is about to happen. So that's where the, you know, the first verse comes in. Now, so what we're going to now look at, Allah mentions seven different qualities in these ayah. Seven different qualities. The first one is in the second ayah, right? And it says, uh, actually no, before I actually go into that, all these ayah that are about to come, all these ayah that are about to come, they all, most of them they start off with, الَّذِينَ هُمْ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ And if you translate this, it means, those who are, and so on and so forth. Those who are, and so on and so forth. And what is the, the maqsad, what is the point of this? That you've got to understand that the moment is an ideal. Right? And not many of us can reach that ideal. So when Allah subhanahu wa uses those who are, it's referring to a third person ideal so that you have an idea of where you're standing, how far you are from that ideal state. You know? So I was at a, you know, a fiqh course on marriage and then one of the shaykhs mentioned, you know, so he was talking about imagine you're talking to your future spouse. Imagine, right? 
you're not going to go to the first meeting and say, you need to cook, you need to clean, you need to do this, blah, 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 blah. And it's, that's a bit heavy, right? That's a bit heavy. So what you do is just a change of language. You say, I would like my wife to be like this. She needs to be able to cook, to clean, and so on and so forth. So she can then see how far or close she is from that ideal vision, that third person, right? Just like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uses that. Al-ladina kum. They are those who so and so. Everyone got that concept? Yeah? Okay. Very good. So the first ayah says, Al-ladina hum fi salatihim khashi'um. Al-ladina hum fi salatihim khashi'um. Now, a very interesting question for three candies. Three candies. What does khushu' mean? Where the word khashi'um comes from? Khushu'. Silence. Trying to have kushu is kushu. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I have a connection with God. Okay, I'll give you a candy. All right. Yes, Reza. Happiness. Okay, I don't think that's happiness. <laughs> I'll give you a candy for trying. I'll give you a candy for trying. Huh? Shows? Satisfaction. Satisfaction, okay. Serenity, yep. Okay. Is it fear, fear out of love? Fear, okay, fear out of love, very good. Okay, mashallah, all right, okay. Well, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm not good at naming, I don't know how to Right, okay. So we, we've got a couple of, you know, a few definitions, okay? Now, generally, if you look at the seers, and in the ulama, they have varied uh, understandings of what kushua means. Some people say, you know, it means humility. Uh, some people say it means happiness. Some people say tranquility. Some people say fear, right? Some people say fear. Now, if you read the English translations, some of the English translations, they always translate, most of the times, khushu as having fear or God consciousness of Allah, right? Now, it's very difficult to understand the distinction between taqwa, between khawf, and khushu because all three are translated as fear in the English language, in the English language I'm talking about, right? Now, khushu, the way I learned it from, you know, uh, what's it called, from other teachers, right? He said that, uh, imagine you have a very strict teacher, you know, oh, put your hands up if you had a strict teacher in your life, like a very strict teacher, yeah? Khalaf, see, see, and all of you have, must have had a very strict teacher, right? Now, imagine you're in the classroom, right, you're in the classroom, and you're just talking to your friend, and then suddenly, you hear, you hear your teacher, and suddenly, you know, like that, yeah, your whole muscle, you feel every single atom on your body, the hair stands on your back, full concentration on the teacher, so, that is khushua. That's the state of khushu. Fear, concentration, and just in complete awe. That's what khushu is. That's one way to define it, right? That's what khushu is. To be able to understand exactly where you are, what you're doing, who you're doing it for, in a state of awe. Right? In a complete state of awe. Yeah? Now, and I don't need, obviously I don't need to mention the importance of khushu in Salah, right? But there are a lot of different, what's it called, interpretations, a lot of different hadith that we can narrate. I'll just narrate two, inshallah. So there's a hadith in, uh, what's it called, mentioned in Ma'ad al Quran and a few other shirs, where they say that when you're focused in Salah, right? Remember, you're talking to Allah. In this conversation, you're talking to Allah. When you're in Salah, right? And if you're, you know, distracted, you're looking here and there, scratching your beard like this, you know, you're pulling on your phone, you know, trying to look good and everything. The moment you divert your attention away, Allah diverts His attention away from you. If you divert your attention away from Allah, Allah diverts His attention from you. That's one hadith, right? Another hadith is this. Now you've got to understand that there's a, uh, there's a shaitan who is in charge, who is in charge of making sure that you lose as much barakah as you can from the salah. That's his ambition and his goal. And he, there's a hadith who says, Satan tries to steal from your prayer every time you try and look left and right or you try and get distracted from the salah. There's a shaitan that's, you know, that's assigned for this topic, right? And what is, you know, what is jihad in the salah? You know, what is the struggle? Is to try and make sure that you try and maintain focus, try and maintain concentration, all sorts of stuff, right? Now, you know, we, have, we can have many different forms of advice on how to gain so how to gain khushu. Does anybody here have any advice on how to maintain khushu? <laughs> Nobody has an idea on how to make it. Sure. Understand what you're saying. Understand what you're saying. Mashallah, very good. Now, most of you are non Arabs, right? Most of you are non Arabs. And sometimes when you're reading the, the verses of the Quran, you don't know what you're saying. It's just something that's been taught to you. A very good way in trying to develop khushu, to try and develop meaning, 
is to try and understand the word of God, right? Another advice, does anybody have any other ways on how to maintain khushu? Okay, very good. Fakan, well done, mashallah. So one of the advices the brother mentioned is, imagine that this is your last salah. Imagine that after this khalas, as soon as it's salamu alaykum wa Allah, salamu alaykum wa Allah, you hit your deathbed. That's it. How will you focus if you make sure and you think that every salah you're praying is like your last? Huh? For the socket, any other advice? No advice? Huh? Anas, you've been silent. Huh? Any other mishayat? How to maintain khushu in your salah? Any advice? No advice? But there's a sign. No problem, inshallah. There's a book by Sheikh Muradjid. A very thin book, brown book. 33 ways to improve your khushu in salah. Buy it, inshallah. It's a very good book in trying to get your connection and your salah more focused, more oriented towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In English, very easy to read. Very thin as well. So it's not too heavy. Now, to give you, you know, a highlight of how the Prophet and his companions were, I'll mention a small narration on how much they focused in their salah, how much they focused, right? So there was a small expedition that was going on, right? A small expedition. And it was night time, right? It was night time. So the Prophet he wanted to sleep, okay? Now, he had two people. He had two people with him. Uh, one was an Ansari and one was a Muhajir, sorry, Muhajir, right? Now, Ansari means people of Mecca, Muhajir means a people from other people. Muhajir means people from Mecca, Ansari means people from Medina, that's simply one, right? So, the Prophet was sleeping and they said, okay, khalas, you will uh, look out for the, you know, you will maintain guardship while we sleep, inshallah, and then I'll change it. So this guy, you know, he's guarding the Prophet and other companions, and it's late night, you know, he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do, right? So he said, khalas, I'll pray some extra salah, I'll get some salah, inshallah, I'll try and pray, pray right? So he's praying, okay, he's praying. Just call the tree prayer. I do, you call it whatever you want. Now, what happens is an enemy approaches them, right? And an enemy approaches them. And he sees this guy praying. So he takes a bow and arrow straight at him. And he goes into his backside, right? Now the Sahaba, you know, me and you, you know, if we get an arrow khalaf, we'd be screaming like that, you know? We'd be flying all across, right? You know, but this Sahabi, mashallah, look, look at how much concentration he had. All he did was, he pulled out the, the arrow, left it, and then continued reciting. That's it. That's all he did. The enemy again, a second arrow, again, hit, the, hit, hit him. And all he did was, took out the arrow, continued reciting. And this happened the third time. And again, he didn't feel it. And he continued reciting. Until eventually, you know, the amount of blood that was not coming out was too much. So he started feeling weak. So he woke up his companion who was sleeping, right? And the companion noticed that this guy is injured. He's injured, right? And he asked him, you've been shot three times. Why did you not wake me up in the first arrow, in the first shot? He said that I was so much in love with the surah I was reciting that I could not stop myself. And if it only for the reason because I was defending the Prophet wasallam then I decided to distract my salah and wake you up. Otherwise, I would have died in my salah. I would have died in my salah, right? And for those of you who want to look up extra, and this, this Sahabi's name was Abad ibn Bishr, inshallah. So it's very good to remember the names of these Sahabi. You mentioned as this Sahaba said and that Sahaba said. It's very good to maintain um, a remember, the memory of the uh, root Sahaba and so on and so forth. So that's the first verse, right? The second verse we go on, and inshallah it says, Okay? Now again, if you look at the translation, right? If you look at the translation, it says, and you know, those who stay away from idle talk. Now, just a question. What is lalom? What is lalom? What is lalom? <coughs> yes, Raha? Uh, <coughs> Sorry? Talking which is useless. Talking which is useless. Talking which is useless. Very good. Excellent. Anything else? Anything that distracts you from the little of Allah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anything that distracts you from the of Allah? Anything else? Anything else? No, okay. So, level is basically, um, the scholars have defined it as two, it basically has two components. One, that is of no benefit to you in this life, and two, that has no benefit to you in the next life. So, something that is completely useless. Something that is completely useless. So, something that you know, what we do on a general occasion, gossip. Right? Gossip. Gossip is something that any, no one has benefit for. It's just something we do for the sake of killing time. That's all we do, you know? Now, 
we, we need to make sure we understand this ayah in a very modern perspective. We can't go so extreme and we can't get too relaxed, okay? We have to understand that we are human beings, right? And as human beings, we have social needs. Isn't that correct? We do have social needs, right? And as a result of that, we are naturally just going to have some interests in this world which are not going to help us in the Akhan. Some of us, some of the brothers here are interested in football. And we watch football matches. The Pakistani and the Indian brothers here, they love cricket, right? And then you, you won't be able to change that. Some people are into cars, right? Some people are into, you know, uh, I don't know, motorbike magazines and so on and so forth. That's just a natural part, okay? Now, obviously it's very good if you can try and avoid all of that. It's very good, alhamdulillah, very good. Luqman, you know, he even advises that in, 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 in Surah Luqman, Surah 31, he says that, and, you know, they stay away from, uh, you know, what's it called, Lahu uh, Hadith, and his things are useless, completely useless, that have no benefit at all. No benefit whatsoever. So it's a very good thing if you can achieve it. But you've got to understand that you're living in reality. And as a result, we have brothers and sisters who are on different levels of Iman, right? Now, let's say for example, let's say for example, and you, mashallah, you're practicing brother, or uh, practicing sister, and you happen to know a lot about football. You watch football here and then this or something good. It's not true, right? And you understand some football players, some football team, so on and so forth. And you see a non-practicing brother. Yeah, you see a non-practicing brother there, right? But you know he is obsessed with football. He will know the Nistel Roy, the history of the past 20 years of football, when FIFA was made, so on and so forth. Yeah? So he's just obsessed, but he's not a practicing Muslim. Now, if you talk to him, and if you talk to him, and you just talk to him just about football, and you know he knows that you're a practicing Muslim. Wow, mashallah, you will not understand football. He knows his stuff, right? Eventually, now you can form a connection. What you have to understand that some of our non-practicing folk, they don't have a spiritual dimension at all. They don't have one, right? So for you to try and connect them with the deen will not work at all. So what do you need to connect them with? On something simpler. And that is the human level. And the human level works on social interests, right? Social interests. So inshallah, if you then talk to them about football, you might be close to his friends, right? And then eventually he might take you more and more advice from you, right? And eventually he might, you know, you say, bro, let's go to the masjid, let's just pray one more time, right? Let's just pray. So he comes with you and he prays the salah. One week ago, this guy was doing zina and alcohol and so on and so forth. You know? At least you've managed to influence him a little bit towards the deen. Right? So you've got to understand this from a very modern perspective. Very modern perspective. Generally, it's advised to stay away from such things. But sometimes, these things can be used. Can be used for beneficial purposes to call people to the deen. Right? Now, uh, just one last comment on this ayah. Inshallah, then we'll finish off the lesson. Imam Ghazali. MashaAllah, Imam Ghazali was a brilliant scholar of our, of, of our Islamic generation, right? And he had, actually had a very, very interesting analogy about time and how you use time, right? Now, Imam Ghazali, in his book, Alchemy of Happiness, he said that imagine, right, that you have 24 boxes in front of you in the Akhmah. So when you die and you're in Akhmah in front of Allah, you have 24 boxes in front of you, okay? Each box represents an hour in this life. Each box represents an hour. So you have 24 hours a day, one box, one hour, right? He said, if you do something good in that one hour, if you do something good in that one hour, then when you open that box in the Akhara, mashallah, you'll see a lot of beautiful things come out. And you'll feel happy that you did good things at that time, right? Like worship, ibadah, dhikr, charity, so and so forth, right? He said that the other extreme, if you do something haram, right, if you do something really bad in that one hour, when you open up that box in the akhirah, what's going to happen? You will feel disgusted, repulsed by what you did, because you see now what the consequences are in the akhirah. And then he said there's a third option. There's a third option, right? And he said that, imagine that in that one hour, you did absolutely nothing. You did absolutely nothing. Neither benefit, neither harm. And when you open that box in the Akhara, you will see an empty box. And when you see that empty box, you will begin to cry. Because you realize that was a wasted opportunity. That was a wasted opportunity. Right? So inshallah, I hope that analogy puts things into perspective.
perspective on hey, but what's on one, what how you organize yourself in terms of time, and B, what you put yourself into in terms of content. Always make sure that inshallah, that in every single hour you've done at least one good deed, one dhikr of Allah, or one sort of remembrance of Allah. Be it through tafsir, a good deed, a charity, even a smile. Even a smile. Inshallah, we'll be concluding the lesson today, inshallah, and we'll start off again with next week. We'll try and finish this off. Uh, Thank you much. Uh, any questions? Sorry. Any questions? No, inshallah.